Welcome. I'm so excited to have you join us today. My name is Linda Williams. I am a Community Outreach and Training Manager with Consumer Action. And on behalf of the entire staff of CA, I would like to welcome you to the webinar. I am so excited about the conversation we get to have today about the Emergency Broadband Benefit Program. We've all heard those nightmares about kids trying to learn remotely and in low-income communities they couldn't get connected. Well, on May 12th, the FCC began accepting applications for the Emergency Broadband Benefit Program, a program that would provide $3.2 billion to eligible households to pay for internet service and a device so consumers can stay connected. I know you have a ton of questions about the program, and we have two great speakers with us today that will share their expertise and years of experience. So get ready to be amazed. Now, before I get too excited, I need to go over a few housekeeping tips so that you can have the best training ever. As the announcer stated, when you join the webinar, you are in listen-only mode, but you can use the question function on the right of your screen to type in your question. At the end of the presentation, my colleague, Nelson Santiago, will facilitate a question and answer segment with our guest speakers. This is where we get to hear from you. So please take a minute, find that question function so you can send Nelson a ton of questions. Now, if you're on Twitter, you can use that platform to ask your questions. Our organization handle is at Consumer Action and CA Webinars. Now the webinar is being recorded and a link to the recording uh, will be made available along with the PowerPoint slides used for today's presentations and a few handouts will be made available to you by tomorrow afternoon at the latest. At the end of the training, you will receive a survey about today's webinar. We value your feedback as we work diligently to improve our service to you. It's all about you. So if you have a comment, a suggestion, or even a compliment, we would like to hear from you. So please complete the survey. Uh, you will receive a certificate of completion as a bonus for us for attending today's webinar. Now, before I go any further, I need to take a moment to thank our sponsor for the opportunity to bring you today's free webinar. This webinar is being presented with funding from AT&T, and on behalf of the entire staff at Consumer Action, we would like to thank AT&T for this great uh, opportunity. Now, let me tell you a little bit about the wonderful agency that I work for. What do we do at CA? Well, as it says, there on the screen under Welcome to Consumer Action, through education and advocacy, we fight for strong consumer rights and policies, but for all consumers, but especially for marginalized, underrepresented consumers nationwide. How? At CA, we advance consumer rights nationwide uh, through our national hotline by publishing education materials on those pocket book, take kitchen table issue, such as money management, budgeting, how to save. Most of us don't know how to save. Keeping your home insurance, all types of insurance, medical, auto, disaster, renter, homeowners, uh, identity theft, protecting your privacy, lifeline, and emergency broadband benefit program all in multiple languages reaching to consumers where they are. We also advance consumer rights by advocating for consumers in the media and before lawmakers through networking, coalition building, media outreach, and of course, community outreach. Now, let me tell you about our latest fact sheets that we've created on the Emergency Broadband Benefit Program. When you're on our website, you can type EBB, uh, emergency broadband, a lifeline in the search bar, and voila, you will find all of our latest resources on the lifeline and the emergency broadband benefit program. The information is relevant. It is complete. You can use the information and materials to lead a robust training on lifeline or an emergency broadband benefits program. Okay, so when you're on our website, please download those new brochures. Now, let me um, take a minute and go over the agenda so you know where we're headed today. At Consumer Action, we believe in making learning fun. So we open up each and every training by testing your knowledge on the topic of the training with our most popular game, How Much Do You Know? Today, we have four true and false questions on the Emergency Broadband Benefit Program. Following the game, I will introduce you to our dynamic guest speakers. 
a question and answer session led by Nelson Santiago will follow. I will come back, tell you how to donate to Consumer Action and wrap up. Okay, so now in the spirit of the Olympics is happening in Tokyo this Friday, let the game begin. Let's roll out our first question. This is how the game is going to work. We have uh, four true and false questions. Um, the person with the most correct answers win the game and get the consumer action bragging rights. So let's go to the first question. Question one, true or false? The EBB program will put a monthly subsidy of $50 or $75 for households on tribal land into the consumer's bank account each month. Is that true or is that false? Don't overthink it. The EBB program will put a monthly subsidy of $50 of $75 in the consumer's bank account each month. Is that true or, that's, or is that false? Okay, let's close the poll. And let's take a look at the results. Okay, 47% of you says it's true, 53% think it's false. Well, 47%, you're sorry, you're incorrect. The answer is actually false. Uh, the participating broadband service provider will receive the funds directly from the EBB program. No one, no consumer will receive $50 or $75 in their bank account. Okay, let's move on to the next question. Consumers with a past due balance or a collection account with previous internet providers are eligible for the EBB program. Is that true or is that false? Don't overthink it. Don't overthink it. Is that true or is that false? Okay, let's close the poll. 66% says it's true, 34% thinks it's false. Actually, that's true. The FCC rule says that even if your bill is delinquent, your ISP, internet service provider, still has to let you sign up for EBB. Now you still may owe the bill, but they must let you sign up for the uh, EBB program. Okay, let's go to the next question. If you already received Lifeline uh, benefits, you will automatically be enrolled in the EBB program. Is that true or is that false? Don't overthink it. If you're already receiving Lifeline benefits, you will be automatically enrolled in the EBB program. Okay, let's look at the results. 24% thinks it's true, 76% thinks it's false. Actually, that's false. You must opt in with your existing provider or request enrollment in the EBB program with a participating broadband provider and then choose an eligible plan. Okay, let's go to the last question. The e the EBB program is temporary unless Congress choose to extend the program. Mm. Is that true or is that false? Is it up to Congress? The EBB program is temporary unless Congress chooses to extend the program. Is that true or false? Let's look at the results. Wow, 84% of you think it's true and only 16% think it's false. Actually, that's true. <laughs> the program was developed in response to the COVID-19 pandemic and it would end once the program funds are exhausted or six months after the Department of Health and Human Services declare uh, an end to the pandemic, which is the reason why we give in this training because we need adaptability here. So if we can show that there's a huge need for the program, perhaps, perhaps Congress will extend the program for those low-income families. Thank you so much for um, participating um, in the program. So, uh, in the, I'm sorry, participating in the game. And let's move on to um, our future presentation. 
Our first guest speaker is Amina Fasalula. She is the Director of Equity Policy at Common Sense Media. Amina is going to share with us information about the digital divide, what it is and who it affects, the state of divide and whether it is shrinking and how the infrastructure plan that we hear a lot about on cable news that's pending in Congress, how it can help um, close the divide. But first, let me tell you a little bit about her. She is the Equity Policy Council in Common Sense Media's DC office, where she works on a range of issues, including privacy, expanding access to technology, and digital well being. Prior to joining Common Sense, Amina was a tech policy fellow at Mozilla, where she worked to promote broadband connectivity in underserved communities around the world. Amina has worked with the Benton Foundation, U.S. Public Interest Research Group for the Honorable Chief Judge James M. Rosenbaum of the U.S. District Court of Minnesota and at the FCC. Did I mention she's also an attorney? Welcome to the webinar, Amina. Now, please, audience, uh, help me welcome David Sabalane to Consumer Actions webinar. David is going to discuss the nitty gritty, the nuts and the bolts of the emergency broadband program, everything you need to know about the program, how to qualify, how to apply. But first, let me tell you a little bit about uh, David. Since 2018, David has been a consumer education and outreach specialist for consumer affairs in the outreach division at the Federal Communications Commission, the FCC. Previously, he worked in the web and print publishing division where he wrote and edited numerous consumer outreach materials. David joined the FCC in 2001 as part of the Office of Legislative Affairs after having worked as a legislative aide. Uh, for John Glenn and represented Sherrick Brown. In 2003, he joined the Media Bureau Office of Communications and Industry Information, where he responded to congressional inquiries and the FOIA request, as well as draft um, briefing memos on Media Bureau issues. Uh, David has a BA in political science from John Hopkins University and an MA in American government from American University. He is the proud father of two sons. He leads a club scout pack, enjoy performing music and theater and singing and plays bass in the FCC band. And the next time I'm in DC, David is gonna have to get me tickets to that one of those shows. Okay, now before, uh, welcome to the webinar, David. Now, before I turn the webinar over to our first speaker, I have um, a question. The Benton Institute posted an article last month on this website about broadband gaps and dirty secrets. And according to the article, redlining still exists, but now it's in digital form which is why rural and poor communities often don't have the internet or they are stuck with slow, slower internet networks that don't meet their needs. So Amina, say it ain't so. Is there a geographically based um, digital redlining problem out here in America? Let me turn this presentation over to you so you can let us know. Okay, Amina, you take it away. Yeah, you know, Linda, thank you for the introduction and having me on. Um, I'm really excited to speak to the group today. Um, as for redlining, yes, it does exist. Um, and redlining exists in lots of different forms. It's a term that usually is associated with um, any kind of sort of uh, uh, discrimination to a geographic area and um, typically and that's not uh, I wouldn't say that's Webster's definition um, but what we have been talking about uh, broadband advocates we've been saying that digital redlining is something that exists and is persisting and is starting to cause issues um, with our attempts to close the digital divide um, what it basically means is that there are communities who have been traditionally left behind um, in, in various ways, uh, access to businesses, access to underlying infrastructure, um, which leads into access to opportunities. Um, these communities are usually 
disproportionately low income communities and communities of color. Um, and so, uh, you know, one might say if there's a geographic tie, is it related to um, terrain? Sometimes terrain can be part of it, um, but often what it truly is is about um, a business decision or a policy decision on whether or not a community, which may not be as lucrative to uh, various industries, whether it's uh, um, you know a dry cleaner or a grocery store or um, infrastructure companies like broadband, it's not as lucrative. Um, it takes uh, pressure from local government or state government or federal government to actually serve them in an appropriate way um, because most businesses will decide they just won't get a great return on investment and so they just won't go there. Um, and that just leads to communities being underserved in various ways. So yes, sadly, digital redlining exists and it further complicates how we can close the digital divide um, because of its very existence. Um, so, you know, that's a that's kind of a, a down note to start on, but I do think we are looking at a really um, unprecedented year of opportunity um, in front of us when it comes to the digital divide. Um, there is a great deal of interest and in understanding in the issue of um, everyone needing access to the internet and access to computing devices and access to the skills and the training necessary to take advantage of technology. Um, institutions are understanding that if they want to serve their citizens and their communities um, efficiently and resiliently that they need to be able to rely on technology to some extent and that means that everybody's got to have access to it and training to it and it's got to be affordable as well so i think there's a lot of hope here now that there has been a substantial change in our understanding of the digital divide and not only that it relates to uh, vulnerable populations but also to these institutions like healthcare and education and um, to deliver government services to deliver access to unemployment benefits to deliver access to vaccines um, there's just a whole host of efficiencies and benefits to the whole community if everyone is connected. Um, so, so this year we've got um, the reconciliation um, package that's moving. Um, we expect that to include some components related to the digital divide. An infrastructure package, which many of you probably heard about, there's a bipartisan deal that incorporates broadband infrastructure and even elements like cost support, um, that's included. Um, we know that there's action by the FCC, like the EBB program, the Emergency Connectivity Fund, which is focused on schools and libraries. Um, the NTIA has a, a few different programs um, that are headed out the door um, in tribal lands and in, in a, a new minority broadband office. Um, and Treasury is also even um, engaged in helping close the digital divide with um, capital expenditure funding, which can be used for broadband and to close the digital divide, not just for infrastructure, but also for digital inclusion needs. Um, you know, there's going to be action by individual states, and that's already occurring. Virginia just announced an initiative around broadband. Maryland announced initiatives around broadband. Pretty much every governor in the country has said something about the digital divide and needing to close it. Um, just last week, there were big steps in California um, to close the digital divide where they're investing billions of their own state dollars towards closing the digital divide, coupled with money coming from the federal government. So there's a lot of hope there. Um, uh, and so let me um, hold on one second while I make sure I'm actually connected. Um, the So let me break down at least one component of the digital divide because it's so broad it's sometimes hard to understand it. Common sense we've been focused on the sort of K-12 digital divide but I think a lot of the lessons from our research can sort of help people understand 
what the digital divide is and how it impacts people and then like what you need actually to close it um is it just you know any internet access to do email or is it something more significant so at the start of the pandemic we did some research to try to understand how many kids that were facing distance learning were in the digital divide and we found about 16 million kids of the k-12 public school students um, were in this digital divide. And that meant they were lacking, you know, uh, access to the internet and to devices. Um, we also found that it existed everywhere in all 50 states. There wasn't a state in the country that didn't have this problem. And sadly, even in the states with the smallest digital divides, one in four students didn't have adequate internet connections or devices. We also found that redlining had an impact, digital redlining. And I think if you take a look at this slide closely in the tiny, tiny print, uh, we referenced some reports done by the Greenlining Institute, which talked about um, the digital divide and redlining um, uh, with some really interesting mapping work that they did in California. Um, there's been lots of evidence of the impact of the digital divide disproportionately impacting rural communities and communities of color. Um, you know, what we found interestingly is that um, in uh, the, the communities by geography, um, they weren't that far apart. You know, one would presume that rural communities would be, you know, really far and away the ones most impacted by the digital divide. And they are significantly impacted. But there is a bit of um, a smaller gap between them and suburban and urban communities, which you would think wouldn't have the geographic problems. Um, and what this indicates to us is that digital redlining is real and has, you know, through policy and um, corporate practices, we've created the same barriers that distance and terrain can create for access, which is which is very sad, but then there's some hope in that because it is a matter of policy change um, to be able to connect those urban and suburban communities where it may take some you know, technological and additional funding to be able to get out to rural communities, but certainly in areas that you know, are blocks away or just miles away from connectivity, um, policy change might make the difference there and you would have you know, huge gains. Um, and you know why does this matter you know what we're finding is that you know during the pandemic the digital divide um, had the potential to accelerate learning loss and this is what we were projecting um, now that we're over a year into the pandemic we are understanding that you know this generation of students through this past year has incredible amounts of learning loss to contend with um, that students are sort of disconnected from their educational experience um, and all of the other wraparound resources that they get through school. Um, and this is in part because uh, the digital divide caused us to be unprepared as a nation to be able to resiliently shift this important essential service education um, and use technology. Um, and so, you know, schools and libraries did an incredible job, you know, finding ways to connect students. But they were doing this, they were, you know, building the plane as they were flying it and um, doing this in the midst of a pandemic when they themselves were experiencing closures. Um, closing the digital divide permanently would make uh, another moment like this where we would have to shift for whatever reason or if we wanted to just take advantage of the resources that can be brought to us through technology, um, you know, we would be able to do that so much better if we actually had um, resources to close the digital divide. Um, what's the long-term impact of uh, what we call the homework gap, that's the K-12 digital divide, um, on lifetime earnings? And again, you can extrapolate this out for groups that are well outside of K-12. Um, you know, we found that there would be 22 to $33 billion annual GDP loss, um, you know, and then there are all these additional public costs, which, you know, would even add to that. Um, you know, this is a, a very, very conservative estimate of 
the impact, um, the economic impact on the country. And then of course, the economic impact on the individual and their families and the economic impact on the community. You know, when you have somebody who is struggling to connect to education, you're going to have somebody struggling to succeed in education. And we understand education as this really important component of um, helping lift somebody out of poverty. So, you know, obviously there's so much that is interconnected to, you know, having access to the internet and access to technology and all these important tools. Um, and not only were, like I said, uh, students impacted, but we found that teachers were lacking adequate access. So, um, you know, and you can extrapolate that out to um, uh, pre-K and preschoolers and daycares. You can extrapolate that out to um, teaching assistants and sort of the wraparound services that come through schools too. So, you know, there are a whole host of folks who are impacted by the digital divide. And when they're impacted by the digital divide, it'll be that much harder for them to do the work that they do um, either remotely or um, to even do it efficiently. And, um, you know, there have been efforts to close this. Um, but most of them have been non-permanent. Um, and so um, the digital divide, because of its connection to income and poverty, um, is something that will persist. And so you need to have a long-term program. The emergency broadband benefit tackles the issues around cost support, around service primarily, although there is a component for devices. Um, and, uh, you know, that is wonderful. But it is something that, you know, we hope um, would be seen as something that's worth continuing because um, once you've connected these people for a short period of time, because we've largely agreed that it's important to keep them connected, to have all of those people drop off again um, would be really dramatic and problematic um, as we go forward in our recovery post pandemic. So certainly we want to be thinking through, you know, what we need to do to close the digital divide and keep it closed. Um, we've estimated just in the context of education and for the K-12 digital divide, um, you know, we would need to have close to, um, you know, uh, between 11 and $6 billion um, or uh, four to $8 billion annually um, to close the uh, permanently close the K-12 digital divide. And in part, I think we've seen that first year cost. So the emergency broadband benefit program, which is 3.2, and the emergency connectivity fund, which is 7.1, um, is largely working um, during the pandemic to do that first year cost to, you know, do sort of immediate work to keep people connected and close the digital divide, at least temporarily. Um, going forward to make sure people stay connected and the digital divide stays closed, we'll need about four to eight billion dollars annually. And these are these are numbers that are actually being considered. So right now, um, as part of the bipartisan um, working group on the infrastructure package, there are um, there is consideration of you know additional funds for the emergency broadband benefit program. And there's also um, conversations on the hill right now to include um, additional funds for the emergency connectivity fund, um, whether it's in the infrastructure package or in through reconciliation. So there's some hope there that, you know, we've got um, attention being paid to this issue and, and that we might get some at least extension to these temporary efforts or potentially um, uh, support for permanent closure. Um, and then what do you need? Um, you know, what what folks actually need is is much more than just sort of access through your cell phone. You know, to be able to sort of adequately access education, um, telemedicine, or some other, you know, remote work or other sort of essential services, you really need to have high-speed broadband internet service, ideally fixed broadband service, um, wireless broadband service via hotspot, so a little bit different than just your mobile phone um, so that it can connect to an actual device could work. And satellite broadband service, depending on its speeds, could also work. Um, 
you know, and, and then what do you need to be able to access it? You really do need to have a laptop or a desktop computer, and sometimes tablets can work. Um, but I, you know, there's a point of caution there, which is sometimes if you really want somebody to explore their world on the internet, a tablet's not going to be a great device because it's going to be limited. And even a Chromebook or some kind of light laptop might not work well if you've got a student in the household that you're trying to encourage into like a STEM field. So, you know, again, we want to think through, you know, what are your goals? for what you're trying to do with your technology and match that up with the actual device. Um, you know, and this is something that I think is important for everyone to keep in mind, especially as they're guiding people to connect. You really wanna have the most robust service um, a household can afford. We found that to have robust distance learning, you really need to have access to 210 Mbps. And that second number, that 10 Mbps, was especially important because a lot of what you do with telemedicine, with distance learning, with remote work, relies on things like webinars and two-way conferencing and sometimes two-way video conferencing. Um, if you're trying to really take advantage of social emotional learning, wraparound services, therapists, um, additional resources like tutoring, a lot of the best versions of that that can be done online, um, which is wonderful because it saves you on travel time and commuting and bus fare and all of that, um, also helps keep you safe if you've got concerns around um, exposure to the virus. All of that can be done potentially through two-way video, but two-way video requires at least 210 Mbps for an experience that would um, you know, really serve a vulnerable population well. Um, you also wanna have a device that's got high memory and that can actually help quick load apps that real-time learning tools, um, again, be able to handle things like telemedicine or other various um, applications that might be a little heavier than your average sort of web surfing. Um, again, having a high quality device is gonna be useful because it sort of prevents frustration. Um, having somebody who's new to technology have to also become you know, tech savvy enough to be able to manage an old or aging device is probably not a good combination. So um, it's great to be able to encourage folks to really seek out the best possible device they can access. Oh, sorry. Um, go back one more and and the last is just this is a, a slide to kind of walk through um, understanding you know the different types of connectivity options um, you know you definitely want to be able to sort of the gold standard is a fixed internet connection to the household um, you know you also want to think through um, potentially hot spots that's a good option um, and then of course that the satellite mesh networks and and um, uh, those are those are sort of all other options that are available. When it comes to the EBV program, um, the focus is really on these fixed internet connections, um, which is really wonderful. Um, and uh, you know that's a great advantage because that really is um, ideal. It gives you sort of the most robust access and potentially um, you know the best quality of service. Um, you know there are def difficulties with sort of other options where um, you may not have as great service, or it may not be able to support the applications that you're trying to, to use. Again, so if you're trying to do some more robust distance learning or telemedicine. Um, so, you know, I'll just close there, but, you know, what I'd like to just note to everyone is, you know, the value of taking advantage of the emergency broadband benefit um, right now is, is so great. Um, there's tons of interest on the Hill on this issue. There's incredible amounts of support from industry on this issue. So we are at this moment where if we can demonstrate that not only are there people in the digital divide, but they are actively seeking to get out of the digital divide, I think more resources will follow. And so we may be able to permanently hold on to a program like the EBB program. So I really encourage everybody to take a listen to what David has to say and take advantage of this program. Great, thank you, Amina. Thank you for that informative presentation. I know you guys have a ton of questions, so start sending those questions in those. 
Now let's get to the nitty gritty, the nuts and bolts of the EBB program. I'm going to turn it over to David. Uh, David, you should have control of the screen. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Linda, for that uh, um, lovely uh, introduction. And thank you, Amina, for all the information you provided. Uh, my name is Dave Sabalin. I'm with the FCC here in Washington, DC. And um, what I'm planning to go over um, as far as the emergency broadband benefit is concerned, first off, what is the benefit? Um, a lot of you may already know some of these um, bits of information that I'm going to provide but I'm going to go over them uh, hopefully in a way that would help you present this information to others. Uh, so bear with me if I um, cover stuff that you already know. So what is the benefit? Who is eligible for the benefit? How households can apply? And finally going over um, the FCC partner toolkit that we have uh, provided uh, to provide uh, resources for those that would like to uh, help promote this program. Oops, I went too far. Okay, there we go. Okay, so what is the benefit? Um, the Emergency Broadband Benefits uh, is a program that provides temporary uh, discount on monthly broadband bills for qualifying low income households. Um, I would want to get uh, rid of the myth that came up in the quiz that this benefit is not a check that arrives in the mail like a, a COVID relief check. Uh, that people may have received um, over the last year. Um, this benefit will appear as a discount on a broadband bill. Um, so once someone has chosen a provider, signed it up for EBB, um, then the uh, discounts that I'm going to mention would show up uh, on their bill, um, not as a check in the mail. The uh, benefits come in two main forms. Um, First is up to $50 per month discount for broadband service and associated equipment rentals. So that includes um, if there's a web router fee, a modem fee, or any of that kind of equipment-based fee, this uh, discount can be applied to that. And for households on tribal lands, that can be up to $75 per month. And the second benefit is a one-time discount of up to $100 for, uh, towards the purchase of a laptop, desktop computer, or tablet purchased through a participating provider. Um, to dispel another myth, this is not a $100 um, gift card for Best Buy that shows up in the mail. This is another discount that would show up on your bill if you purchase um, a laptop, desktop, computer, or tablet through the internet service provider. Not all internet service providers um, sell equipment, but for those that do, um, you can apply this one-time discount. Okay, so who qualifies for the benefits? <clears throat> so a household is eligible if any member of the household received uh, any of a number of uh, federal benefit programs. For example, if they received a Pell Grant during the current award year, uh, if they were approved to receive benefits under a, a free or reduced school lunch program or school breakfast program, if they experienced a substantial loss of income due to job loss or furlough since February 29th of 2020, and uh, this um, particular eligibility requirement has an income cap because this is meant to be for uh, lower income households, that the household cannot have earned more than $99,000 in 2020 for a single filer or 198,000 for joint filers. Um, also, if a internet service provider has an existing program for low income households or for the pandemic to reduce rates, that can also be used as an eligibility uh, marker for uh, this program. And finally, uh, households that qualify for life, lifeline benefits also uh, would qualify for EBB. As the quiz mentioned, it doesn't, you don't automatically get signed up for EBB if you're signed up for Lifeline. You still have to apply and work with an internet service provider. However, uh, if you qualify for Lifeline, then that is a, a, a strong indication that you uh, qualify for EBB. Um, and um, I'm hoping everyone here knows what Lifeline is, but just in case, 
Lifeline is a program that lowers the monthly cost of phone or internet. Um, eligible customers can receive up to $9.25 towards their bill. If they are on tribal lands, they can receive up to $34.25. That's per month. And uh, we also have been emphasizing Lifeline because um, according to the last study that I saw, um, only about one quarter of households that are eligible in the United States for Lifeline actually have signed up. And so while EBB is a temporary benefit, Lifeline keeps going no matter what, because it's funded by the universal service fee on people's phone bills. Um, so while we are promoting EBB, we are also highly recommending that Lifeline also be promoted. Um, to qualify for Lifeline, um, a household income needs to be less than 135% of federal poverty guidelines, or um, a member of the household participates in a number of federal programs, including uh, SNAP, Medicaid, SSI, federal public housing assistance, veterans, pensions, and uh, tribal programs if you live on qualifying tribal lands. All right, so um, we get one benefit per household. So what's a household? Uh, for purposes of EBB, a household is a group of people who live together and share money, even if they aren't related. So if you live with other people and you share money towards household expenses, rent, bills, et cetera, uh, you can be one household. If you either don't live together or you don't share money towards uh, bills, et cetera, then you can be two or more households. Uh, now, uh, household can qualify because of eligible dependent children. So it only takes one person in the household to qualify for the various criteria to make the entire household eligible. However, there is only one benefit per household. Um, even if you have more than one person in the household that would qualify. Um, so you will have to answer certain questions about your household when you apply for EBB um, that will uh, help identify you as a person, um, your address, et cetera. Um, I'll go over that in a bit. Um, and there is a household worksheet available on the um, the application website. I'm going to mention this name of this website several times because this is a thing that I want you to come away from this presentation with, if nothing else. The website that you go to to apply for EBB is getemergencybroadband.org. That's getemergencybroadband.org. And on that website, there is a worksheet that helps um, consumers uh, determine whether they uh, would be eligible. Now, obviously, there's a whole lot of people that live in multi-unit dwellings. And they may share an address, but could be a number of households rather than just one. So households that live within multi-unit dwellings, like nursing homes, apartment buildings, group homes, uh, homeless shelters, et cetera, uh, can take advantage of the benefits, uh, one per household. Now, when the landlord or property manager is an uh, internet account holder for uh, all of the properties uh, of that landlord, um, each household can still apply um, if they qualify. Um, it's recommended that you work with a landlord uh, as far as who is the internet account holder, but you are not required to use the internet service that the landlord has um, signed a deal with. Um, and as was mentioned in the quiz, if a household has a bill or other liability for their broadband access. If they have some overdue bill with um, a provider, uh, they can still sign up for EBB. And they don't have to use the same internet service provider that they have an outstanding bill with. They could, um, but they don't have to. Okay, so uh, as mentioned, uh, we opened uh, signups for enrollments back on May 12th. Um, and uh, as I mentioned before, EBB is a temporary program that was developed in response to the pandemic. And this program is going to end once one of two things happens. Either, firstly, that the program's funds are exhausted, 
or secondly, six months after the Department of Health and Human Services declares that the pandemic is over, whichever one of those comes first. So um, a question we get asked a lot is when will the program be done? Um, and honestly, we don't know because it has to be one of those two criteria that occurs. So um, that's what we would be looking for. And once the program ends, uh, I'll go through that in a, in a moment, um, uh, the benefits would end. Um, the program is administered by USAC, the Universal Service Administrative Company. And it's the same uh, organization that administers the Lifeline program for the FCC. So um, that's another reason why we are promoting the idea of uh, promoting Lifeline at the same time, because you can go on the USAC website and apply for both of them. Um, you won't even have to leave the same website. So um, the USAC website uh, application portal is once again, getemergencybroadband.org. Okay, now there are certain consumer protections baked into this program. Uh, as I mentioned, it is temporary and is going to end at some point. So when it does, um, Congress uh, and the FCC did not want consumers to be stuck with an internet service that they could not afford. Um, so participating providers um, have to give households notice about the last date or last billing cycle that the full or partial benefit will apply to their bill. And they have to provide information about the cost of broadband service uh, once the program ends. And um, households will need to opt in or request to continue broadband services with the, their provider. Uh, this way, uh, it's not like um, those deals that you sometimes hear about where you get a, a free, um, uh, free something for six months and then all of a sudden you're getting, um, you know, have to pay full rates. Um, once this program is over, the broadband service uh, that is associated with EBB will end unless the consumers and the households opt in to continue it. So there's not going to be any surprises uh, in that regard. I skip a nope, I didn't. Okay, I apologize. So the participating providers, uh, like I mentioned, not all internet service providers are participating providers. They had to register with the Federal Communications Commission and agree to meet certain standards. Um, providers include fixed broadband service um, providers um, such as cable and fiber optic DSL to directly to your home and satellite service and fixed wireless. Um, also, mobile broadband services um, uh, can be part of the EBB program. I will mention, however, that uh, it's another question that we often get asked. Um, for the equipment benefit, the up to $100 towards a, a purchase of equipment, that cannot be used towards the purchase of a mobile phone. It has to be a desktop, laptop, or tablet. That's just how Congress wrote the um enacting legislation um but that doesn't mean that you can't get your broadband service through ebb from a mobile provider um so it's merely a question of whether you can get the equipment benefit um but you can absolutely get the up to 50 dollars uh, per month off the service from either a fixed or mobile broadband service um, so you'll have to check with your broadband providers in your area about their plans. And we have a list uh, on the FCC's uh, EBB websites um, listed by state and territory of all participating providers on www.fcc.gov forward slash broadband benefit. That's one word. So www.fcc.gov forward slash broadband benefit. And that's also where we have a lot more of our resources about this program. And um, it's also important to note that not all providers uh, offer the devices. They, not all of them sell the devices. Um, on our website, we list, in addition to listing all of the providers, we have a column, a check mark as to which ones um, will provide the devices. 
Okay, so how do we enroll? There's three basic ways. Uh, one is to contact a participating provider directly and learn about their application process. So let's go directly to the provider. Second option is go to, there's that website again, getemergencybroadband.org and apply online. And then uh, once uh, having applied, uh, find a provider near you. And the third option for those that are not currently connected to the internet, which makes a lot of sense given the nature of this program, one can mail in an application along with proof of eligibility to Emergency Broadband Support Center, PO Box 7081, London, Kentucky 40742. And all of these, uh, uh, this information is available on the FCC's EBB page and at getemergencybroadband.org. Um, so when I click away from the slide, I'm hoping no, people aren't <laughs> scribbling really quickly as far as that mail-in application address. Uh, I will provide it again at the end. So enrolling verse, uh, through a provider. Um, we have our list of participating providers by state. Um, you could contact them directly and the service provider uh, may offer assistance with applying through the National Verifier Service Portal, or they may have their own verification process to see who is eligible uh, for this program. The National Verifier Service is the program that USAC uses to verify that people are eligible for Lifeline, and they're using that same verifier service to uh, um, determine eligibility for EBB. Now applying directly online. Um, so going to getemergencybroadband.org, uh, near the top center of the website is how to apply, and then click that and you complete the electronic application. Uh, once receiving the eligibility determination from the national verifier, then with your EBB um, verification in hand, you contact the service provider of your choice and enroll. and applying by mail. Um, an application can be downloaded and printed at getemergencybroadband.org. And uh, some participating providers may also be willing to uh, provide paper applications to consumers. And there is the address um, in London, Kentucky. And um, when doing the mail-in process, you will have to provide supporting documents to prove eligibility um, and the, the worksheet is printable. Um, the eligibility worksheet is printable as well to help people figure out which um, means they are claiming for their eligibility and what they would need to mail in. Now showing that you qualify. When applying, they are going to ask questions uh, con to confirm your information automatically, um, including uh, identity information, address, eligibility. I will note at this point, um, I don't think they've changed this yet. On the uh, online application process, one of the fields that someone could fill in is the last four digits of your social security number. I note this because you do not have to provide that information. I know that there are some people who are very nervous about providing their social security number in part or whole and uh, if someone comes to that screen and it says to do the last four digits, there's a link right underneath it that um, someone can click if they don't want to provide that information. So if you're working with constituents and they ask that question, you do not need to provide social security number. Um, and the additional information about eligibility can be mailed or submitted electronically. And they have examples of acceptable documents to validate the information um, at getemergencybroadband.org. Okay, finally, closing out, uh, here is uh, information on our outreach toolkit. We have put together a collection of social media, printable and other um, tools that uh, can be used um, to help raise awareness about EBB. These tools are all publicly accessible, downloadable, and free to use, and they also can be co-branded or adjusted uh, to match um, a preferred voice that works better with your own constituencies. Uh, on the toolkits, there's uh, social media um, 
tools such as logos, images, um, draft press releases, there's printables, uh, there's also a video and audio PSAs that are available. Um, you see here some of the logos and pictures that um, could be used in social media um, and the draft social media posts and newsletter inserts that uh, we have created. And printables such as flyers, posters, uh, info cards, infographics. And finally, we have uh, various um, videos and PSAs, including one in American Sign Language, uh, radio PSAs, and a PowerPoint slide deck, much like the one I'm using right now, uh, if you want to provide a presentation of your own. And uh, as far as accessibility, um, all of our materials, all of our consumer materials are translated into English, Spanish, and quite often into a number of um, uh, AAPI languages. But some of our materials like fact sheets and handouts, we have translated into these 12 languages that you see here. Uh, if there's any other language that um, one might need, uh, feel free to, to send us a, a line and we can try and work something out. Um, I would email uh, such a request to broadbandbenefit at fcc.gov. That's broadbandbenefit at fcc.gov. Also, we have alternative format um, uh, materials such as Braille, large prints, and electric, uh, electronic files. If you uh, need those, you can send an email to the email address here, fcc504 at fcc.gov. That's fcc504 at fcc.gov. And um, so here are the last bits of information. Uh, our EBB uh, information page is www.fcc.gov forward slash broadband benefit. The toll free number, this is something to write down, um, for USAC, for people who have questions about EBB, including questions about their own applications, uh, the toll free number is 833-511-0311. That's 833-511-0311. And finally, lastly, once again, here's that email at, um, here's the website, getemergencybroadband.org. Thank you very much for this opportunity to present and I'm happy to take any questions you have. Great. Thank you, David. Amina and David, that was a ton of information. Thank you so very much. Audience, please join me in sending David and Amina the love for those uh, great presentations. Now it's time for us to hear from you. So I'm going to turn it over to my colleague, uh, Nelson Santiago. Nelson, I bet you have a ton of questions. Yes, we do have lots of questions, Linda. Thank you to the speakers who did a great job. And yeah, please go ahead and submit any questions now if you have uh, more questions. I'll start with what I have. Um, someone's asking, in general, will there be any long-lasting improvements to broadband infra infrastructure? Will improvements persist after this fund expires or after it's exhausted? So I can try to field that. Um, this is Amina. Um, so one, yes, there are definitely um, improvements to infrastructure underway. Um, both states and the federal government are spending um, resources on uh, extending uh, the capacity of broadband infrastructure into communities that are unserved or underserved. Um, you know, but the the devil is in the details. So, you know, a lot of these efforts might be to reach areas that really don't have any um, fixed broadband option or any broadband option other than p potentially satellite. Um, in in that case, um, you know, the the effects of it will largely be localized to these areas that are, you know, very much um, unserved or underserved. Um, for areas that are redlined. Um, that takes, you know, the ability to to build where there might be at least an option in the area to some amount of broadband service, but maybe not high quality service. Um, and the administration has messaged through their American Jobs Plan, and um, and we've seen some of the language that's been floated for the infrastructure package to include this notion that areas 
um, where you're going to build should be, you know, really robust, like 100-100, so that the, you know, basically fiber infrastructure and and where you should build should be areas that are um, unserved in really significant ways in terms of how it meets our current needs. So, you know, uh, one number that's been floated is 25-25 Mbps. So again, that second number is a really critical number, which indicates to you the upload speeds. And so you know, there's this focus on improving improving existing infrastructure and um, encouraging competition as one way to do it, but then also expanding infrastructure to areas that don't have access and making sure whatever you put in the ground is actually capable of meeting today's needs and, and capable of meeting tomorrow's needs. Um, on the expansion of the, the program lasting, you know, I think, well, at least on the infrastructure side, again, and the administration is sort of keeping this eye on a lasting impact. So that's why they're sort of calling for that hundred hundred number or the the push for fiber. Um, the on the cost support side, a number of organizations and and in the administration also have also sort of said that there needs to be a long term cost support program to support broadband service to the home. Although I think the details are still, you know, out there, open question. So we're not quite sure what it'll end up being. Will it be EBB just made permanent, or will it be some version of EBB? Um, that that's yet to be known. Great, thank you, Amina. Uh, and um, you know, if do you have anything to add to that, David? Because both of you can certainly answer the questions um, and. Feel free to add or to ask questions of each other if you want to, but I'll go ahead and move on to the next one. Um, just it's a sort of te technical one. Are there any discounts for install fees? If if somebody's face say with a long list of installation fees or something like that, can any discounts be applied to that? The um, the fifty dollars per month uh, can cover the installation fee. Um, the up to fifty dollars per month uh, part of it is uh, that's that's the cap to the benefits, um, and so that part of the equation that goes into it is how expensive of an internet connection um, uh, is being offered, and um, what you know are they offering? Uh, some services may be more than fifty dollars per month, um, but if it's if all costs and fees are less than that, then they're getting their internet service for free. But um, yeah, uh, the installation fee can be covered by the um, the EBB benefits uh, as it stands right now. So that, that would eat up, say, if the first month you have thirty dollars in in installation fees, then thirty would go toward that, and twenty would go toward the service. Um, yeah, I mean, it's all sort of the net. Um, Installation fee is part of the of the cost that would be covered, so it would be a net benefit. So you know, once all the costs are totaled, uh, apply the benefits and whatever is left over. Great. There's somewhat related. Somebody's asking, since these are up to 50, up to 75, what would cause the amount to be closer to the maximum, and what would cause it to be less than the 50? Um, well, that really depends on the uh, the carriers and, and how they do their billing. Um, and there's so many of them, it's hard for me to generalize. But um, yeah, uh, whether it could be uh, some of them um, charging fees, some don't charge fees regarding uh, equipment such as uh, modems and routers, um, or having an installation fee um, that may only happen the, you know once. Uh, that the uh, monthly benefit would still be up to fifty dollars after that first month, um, but yeah, it's it's difficult for me to to generalize um, what uh, the you know private sector ISPs are doing uh, as as far as you know what would push it past the fifty dollars per month because they're getting the the same amount uh, either way whether they're getting it from the consumer or from from the EBB program. Great. And one one thing I wanted to just note is that that fifty dollars or seventy five, if that's what you're eligible for, you know, um, that's what you'll get throughout the the duration of the program. 
depending on, you know, as David is saying, on the actual costs. So, so if you have to pay, you know, forty dollars to incorporate installation, and then later you pay thirty dollars as the program continues, and then you decide to bump up to a program, you know, a service that's sixty dollars, and then you start paying ten dollars, you still get that fifty dollars. It's just a matter of you'll you'll always be eligible for the fifty dollars. Am am I sort of saying that correctly, David? Yeah, absolutely. And I will also mention occasionally we get the question, well, if I only pay $45, do I get a $5 check in the mail? No. <laughs> it's up to $50 per month. And if uh, you manage to have it be less than $50, then the internet service is free, but there is no, you know, it's not a, a hard and fast $50 that somehow you would uh, be able to pocket the rest. <laughs> What it does mean, though, is that the I guess the program might extend a little longer because then there's that you know additional ten dollars back in the the pot for the the program to continue. Well, the uh, the, the the funding for the program is entirely appropriated by Congress, the three point two billion, and if there's going to be more in that program, then it would uh, have to be um, extended or increased by Congress. Right. Yeah, no, no, no. What I was trying to say is that like every 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 dollar is already there, right? That three point two, and it gets yeah. you know it'll get used for the EBB, you know whether you pay thirty dollars or twenty dollars or forty dollars, it'll still get used for the EBB program. Yes. Overall. And then one last question to wrap up these questions about cost. Uh, someone was asking, on average, what are people paying for internet now, and are people finding that oh, this covers half of my bill, this covers all my bill what do, do, do either of you have any kind of stats like that i don't, I don't have any uh, statistics uh, handy as far as uh, how the program is being experienced in that regard um i haven't um i don't believe i have any information regarding whether uh, it, the rates that have been charged nationwide have changed uh, and so much of cost of living expenses uh, affects uh, how much people get charged in different parts of the country. So I, I unfortunately, I don't think I have um, anything in that would be responsive to the question. Yeah, no, what I'd say is, you know, um, as advocates, you know, the $50 amount, you know, is sort of seen as a, a generally, depending on your region, of course, but generally should be able to offer you enough subsidy support that you may not have to add that much on top. However, you know, depending on the quality of service you're seeking out, you might you might see it rise above that $50 amount. So it would be more of a supplement than, you know, covering, discounting it entirely. Um, you know, I, I would just say to folks who are helping to navigate folks through the EBB now, now that the program has been up and running there, you know, generally, depending on where you are, again, um, there are a few options, and I would make sure to sort of walk through what it means to to pick a ver the various options and really try to like help people understand, okay, with this service offering, you get you know this level of speed. Um, with this level of service, you get something else. You know, again, if you're trying to do like things like distance learning or telemedicine, you really want to try to bump up your speeds, especially your upload speed as high as possible. So, you know, it's important to kind of guide folks as they're looking at the various offerings to help make sure that they don't get frustrated by getting, you know, maybe a slower offering and then realizing it's not really meeting their needs. And I'd also mention uh, again that um, promoting Lifeline at the same time it would be a really good idea. The uh, participation rates for Lifeline um, are, are sort of shockingly low. Um, again, it's about 25% nationwide. In California, it appears, I'm, I'm reading off of the USAC website for participation, and it's about 54% of eligible households are signed up for it. In Colorado, it's only 17%. In Hawaii, it's only 9%. It's, um, it's it, in New Hampshire, it's only 9%. It's it's really um, an unutilized or under 
utilized um, resource that could really help a lot more people than it does. And people who sign up for Lifeline can add that ten dollar, almost ten dollar benefit toward toward the broadband, and so get close to sixty dollars total. That is correct. It's it is you know not mutually exclusive. It it would stack on top of EBB. Great. And somebody was asking, are you going to have or already have any stats on the adoption of this EBB? Is it a quarter of the people who call are eligible already signed up, or maybe not five percent of them? Um, I, can, I can tell you that uh, right now, um, well, USAC's last data was released on July 18th, that it's over 3.7 million households have signed up. Um, and as far as how many compared to how many are eligible, um, that's less than a tenth of the uh, households that are eligible. Um, so there's still a lot of people out there that could be benefiting from this. So over 90% of the people eligible, households eligible, we think have not, are still there yeah. to can still take advantage. Yeah, so there's a lot of uh, getting the word out to take place. I'm glad we're having this. Somebody is asking, uh, is, or mentioning how some school districts enroll all students in the free school lunch based program, or the free school lunch program based on the district demographics uh, in low income census tracts. What if a consumer's child is automatically enrolled, enrolled in this free lunch program, but the parent's income is above the income eligibility, eligibility guidelines? Can they still qualify for EBB? Um, that's a, it's a good question. I would have to, uh, um, I, I, I'm trying to, the, the income cap was associated with the, um, the job loss uh, information. So as far as that qualification is concerned, there's the income cap, but if their child is getting uh, qualifies for the free or reduced school lunch program, um, yeah, I, I don't think I have that information. That, that's, uh, I'd I, be happy to follow up and get the answer to that question. I that's have good. a, I, I have like a, my understanding of it is that as long as it like, so for the schools that do um, sort of enroll the entire student population, those students, all those students are actually eligible for EBB. Um, and so, but through, through free and reduced lunch, um, there will be a little bit of overreach, I guess, with some, potentially some students who may not be, would not be able to qualify through any other means. Um, but my understanding is that the commission sort of accepted that potential overreach and um, for just for expediency's purposes. So, um, but see. David, if you want to circle back and just double check on my analysis, um, you know, because yeah, I work pretty closely with students, my understanding is that, um, that it sort of simplifies USAC's process. Um, so, yep. it's, so it's to remove that complication. That sounds right to me, but I, I, I would want to check just in case. Great, and we can get that information out, David, if you get it to us. So thank you. Um, somebody's asking, and this may be a good way to kind of flesh out the household, the definition of a household. Somebody is saying, uh, you know, a disabled American veteran receives a VA compensation, social disability, et cetera. And he owns his home, but he rents it out to individual people um, who are low income, uh, um, who are maybe on SSI, uh, someone just started to work, uh, people, low income folks, uh, including a couple of uh, people who are undocumented immigrants. So he's asking, is, is the household eligible for EBB? And you know, I'm curious, would each individual here be uh, eligible for e the benefit? Uh, given that hypothetical, um that if he's renting out units, then each one of those units uh, would be paying rent and thus be an individual household, so that you would be dealing with a whole bunch of households. However, it sounds very much like uh, each of those households would probably qualify on their own for the benefits. Um, so, uh, yeah, I, if this person, is, if this landlord is interested in, in signing up the um, the various people that are living in these units, um, I'm guessing the landlord could probably uh, use a lot of the information that we've provided 
and assist their um, the people who are living in those units with the process. These are they're renting out rooms, but it's the same, right? The answer is the same. It's these are yes. individual. Yeah. These these would be considered individual households because they uh, they are economic units uh, that are paying their rent in in separate um, as separate units, uh, paying for their bills in separate units, etc. So that sounds like multiple households in one address, and that's each one of them could be eligible, and probably from the description probably would be eligible. And I would also note. This program does not um, have any uh, limits with regarding whether someone is an immigrant, um, wh whether whatever their immigration status is concerned. There's no um, stipulation that people who are or are not U.S. citizens, anyone can apply. Great, thank you. Also related to the household definition, someone's saying, I think you mentioned earlier, you know, whether people share money or not. So is there a, they're just asking, how do you define share money? What does it mean to to be, I guess, a not a separate household in terms of sharing money? Yeah, the um, the the lines are delineated by do they share money towards rents and utility bills and and that kind of uh, basic you know, household expenditures that could be proven uh, that they could provide a bill. Um, for their household uh, that would demonstrate their address and that kind of thing. Um, that's that you, the uh, you know, the economic units. The sharing of money is not um, you know necessarily a literal. It's it's the um, the the grouping of money together to pay for things like rent and utilities, um, you know, tangible expenses that any household would have. Great, thank you. Someone's asking, are there any resources for families that do not have a computer or tablet so that they can have access to the internet? Um, is that for me? Uh, any, anyone who has <laughs> thoughts um, on how families without equipment can access the internet or uh, resources to learn about maybe access in libraries, et cetera? Yeah, that would be one um, recommendation I would have would be um, going to a public library uh, if one is available. Um, also, uh, for all the people who are listening to this call, maybe uh, a point of contact to some of these folks that, um, that there may be uh, people in, within the community that are learning about this and could assist them with the process, printing out the forms for them, um, uh, mailing them in, making sure they have the uh, copies of the supporting documents that they would need. Um, and we, you know, we hope that uh, you know, we've established partnerships with a whole lot of people um, to do exactly that and to do train the trainer kind of um, presentations. Um, and but yeah, all of the information that are available on the websites, you know, that would require internet access. But uh, our intent in in doing these presentations is to try and get to reach those audiences that may not have uh, internet now, and um, then maybe this uh, program would help them get it. Great, thank you. Uh, somebody's asking: Providers are required to share with consumers when when the benefit is going to end. Uh, what do you know? What that timeline looks like? Not when it's going to end, but how will the provider tell you a month before, three months before, how much notice do you get that your your benefit is ending? The um, the stipulations, I believe, I don't want to say the wrong thing here. I um, want to make sure I give the correct answer. Um, I know it has to happen with, it, with an, at least one billing cycle, but um, it may, be more than that. Um, dude, I, if that would be another question. I'd be happy to to follow up with you and make sure I get the correct information. But it'll be at least one billing cycle. Um, that's great. Yeah, we'll send out any additional responses to everyone. So that's fine. Thanks, David. Um, someone's asking: Can someone use a different provider from their Lifeline provider for the EBB benefit if they want a fixed internet connection? 
Yes, uh, you can sign up. Uh, you can already have an existing internet connection um, or uh, existing lifeline uh, arrangements with one provider. EBB offers the opportunity to choose an entirely different provider, um, even if you have you know, an outstanding bill with a different one um, or that you uh, have an existing contract with, you know, and with one, this is uh, one way that you can switch if you want to. Okay, great, thank you. Um, uh, one of the attendees asks, how are we able to access the toolkit with the informational flyers that you mentioned to share with families or with their partner agencies? Yeah, uh, let me, um, I'll give you the, uh, the website. If you go to our, um, the website that I had mentioned, www.fcc.gov forward slash broadband benefit. There are links to our toolkit. Uh, the toolkit's web address is a little bit long, <laughs> so that's why I'm, I'm not just saying it, but uh, yeah, it's fcc.gov forward slash emergency hyphen broadband hyphen benefit hyphen outreach hyphen toolkit. So emergency broadband benefit outreach toolkit with hyphens. Um, and uh, I don't know. Do we have a chat feature? Maybe I can pop it in there. I don't. That's um. Yeah, I'm not seeing the the chat feature. At any rate. Oh, here we are. All right. So I just posted the um, the website for the outreach toolkit in the chat. Uh, hopefully that would make things a little bit more simple. Okay, well, and then we'll, we'll send that out um, if people can't see it. Uh, one more, another question about the installation fees. Uh, what if you your installation fee exceeds fifty dollar mark? Let's say it's a hundred dollars. Will you be able to receive the difference in the future? Say if you're if you're if you're going forward monthly is less than fifty, so can you uh, you know use pay for the installation over several months if you're not using up the entire benefit on your monthly cost? The uh, EBB benefit is a 50, up to fifty dollars per month benefits, uh, and from the government side of things, that does not change. Uh, I don't know if. Um, that would be something that would be worked out with the internet service provider, I, um, but that's not an arrangement that is part of the uh, government side of the EBB program. So I don't know if that would be available, um, but it would not um, change the benefit from our end. Okay, so possibly you can work that out with the provider. Uh, if I, you're not, if you're possibly. Not 50 every every month yeah theoretically it's possible i can't speak for the providers okay uh someone's asking how do you get an application for this if you don't have internet access to download this application um should is there a toll-free number available that you maybe can uh repeat now or was it in one of your slides um i can give you the the usac phone number um so it's, whoops, I'm sorry, don't have it on. So the USAC phone number is, uh, dun, 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 dun. it's 833-511-0311. Uh, uh, but in getting a, um, a printed application, um, some providers might uh, be willing to send one. Um, uh, also community groups, local organizations, and uh, possibly at the public library, it could be printed. Um, but uh, the FCC isn't uh, like actively sending them um, because we've established the link that it's downloadable and printed, printable on the USAC website. Um, so uh, I'm hoping that answers the question. Yes, thank you. Uh, we are getting a couple more questions about data and information. Um, where do you look for data on how many people have signed up locally for EBB? Uh, um, 
on the USAC website, uh, they have information on the, um, the benefit program enrollments and claims tracker. Um, and uh, it um, provides all the um, most up-to-date uh, numbers, uh, weekly, monthly, enrollments by state. Um, there is an Excel file on that page uh, for enrollment by zip code. Um, yeah, I'll, I'll put that link in the chat again. And also, is there, do they have data on what, what percentage of people's ISP fees are being covered by the discount or is that separate research that maybe someone else is doing? Uh, yeah, I don't have that uh, information. Looking, looking through these questions, see a couple more. We're yeah, getting close to the end. We have a couple more. Okay, just to clarify this, if there's any confusion, back it's a back, eligibility and sharing money definition uh, question about about definition of that. If I have a participant who sublets a room to a person. Does that still mean they share money and only one would qualify for broadband? One of their clients is subletting a room to somebody else. Um, well, if it's subletting like a, a rental situation, they could be two households, um, which means that each, uh, both the person who is doing the subletting and the person who is being sublet the room could both apply. Okay, great. You know, I think we do need a little bit more clarification based on this question I'm getting on the equipment, the $100 toward the purchase of equipment. Because I think the suggestion that someone's making here is find equipment online on eBay or wherever and see if it's under your $100 limit. But that's not how it's going to work, right? Or that's not that, how it's working. That isn't how it works. That's correct. Um, it would have to be equipment that's purchased through the internet service provider. Uh, and not all internet service providers are providing uh, selling equipment to their customers. Um, but we do have it marked on our um, EBB page um, as to which ones um, are providing equipment. I'll post a link on that one too. Hold on just a moment. The, um, well, no, that's not the right one. Here it is the listing of providers by state and uh, indication as to what um, whether they provide the equipment or not. Great. Um, now, what happens when your internet provider says they don't participate in the program? What, what should you do? Um, the, Hopefully, uh, using that list of um, uh, uh, internet service, excuse me, I'm tripping over my tongue. Uh, the um, list we have of internet service providers that are participating, um, the hope is that there are ones that are available where they live. And it, that also includes a number of mobile service providers. Uh, so that uh, means that there could be an overlap where in locations where there's only one phone company or one internet service provider that does landline, um, having it available for the mobile broadband services um, means that there hopefully will be choices for consumers. Great, thank you. And I think we're right about at the end, unless someone, something else has come in. Uh, one more, I work with people with disabilities. I have someone who is in their mid sixties what if you don't have the service in your area or the county is, what if there is no service in your area or county? What, how do you find other providers again? So is that just going, going to that same list? Is there? That, that would be my first suggestion is go to the list uh, by state and see if there's any um, that are locally available. Um, and okay. Uh, the the phone number that I provided for USAC also uh, they might be able to break it down further 
the um, okay, the yes, great. Five one one zero three one one number. Great. They say thank you for answering that twice. <laughs> that uh, just saw that you you had already answered. It, so uh, absolutely. So then we are at the end of our questions. Anything else, Amina or David, that you'd like to add for folks to make sure that you know they understand this is a valuable benefit. I have one question before you end the segment, Nelson. Um, so that people will understand, uh, could uh, David or uh, uh, Mina, could you explain briefly why there's a difference in benefits, $50 uh, versus the $75 if you live on tribal land, if you, so that people will understand why the, the amounts are different? Um, yeah, I can uh, take that. The, um, the Congress in creating the, uh, the program uh, made that stipulation and um, yeah, I can't speak for Congress, but I can uh, mention that uh, connectivity on tribal lands uh, is woefully low compared to the rest of the country, even in basic phone service or, you know, and um, the last you know, study that I'd seen about 82% of households nationally reported having a subscription to broadband internet on in tribal lands that's 53%. Um, and the gap um, of connectivity on tribal lands um, goes across the board on a number of different uh, measurables. So, um, you know, Congress can speak for itself. I shouldn't speak for them, but I believe the intent is to try and, and bridge that digital gap that uh, has been so significant and obvious when it comes to tribal lands. Yeah, I think that, that's right. The cost, the cost, because of the combining both the the fact that there's significant low-income communities, plus that the costs of accessing quality service are higher because of a, a lack of robust infrastructure in those communities, is is why you see um, a slightly larger benefit. Great, thank you. And the uh, audience, the link to a lot of the resources that were uh, discussed today will be made available to you when we give you the handouts and the PowerPoint slides. Very special thanks to Amina and David, you both rock. And let me say this before I run out of time, uh, it has been a pleasure working with you both. I feel privileged to have worked with you and I will look for opportunities to work with you in the future. Audience, please send Amina and David some love. Thank them again uh, for providing those uh, informational, informative presentations. Again, I wanna take this opportunity to thank our sponsor, uh, AT&T. Uh, you can find low-cost internet education materials on our website. The address is there at the bottom. You will get the slides, so you will be able to go back and go to that website and download the educational materials. Uh, if you would like to contribute to consumer action, you can do so online by credit card. Uh, we even take PayPal. You can write us a check. You can mail the check to consumer action, attention, membership, and giving at 57 Post, 57 Post Street, Suite 611, San Francisco, uh, 94104. Uh, now, this concludes our webinar for the day. Again, a very special thanks to Amina and David, and thank you, our audience, for joining us today. We are here for you. Did we meet your expectations for the day? Did we meet your expectations? You, If you found the information presented today useful, put that in the comment section of your evaluation. If you would like more trainings like the one presented today, Put that in the comment section of your evaluation. We truly value your opinion. Again, thank you for joining us and thank you for the valuable work that you all do. I want to thank you for your service. I look forward to welcoming you back real soon. Keep an eye on your inbox. Enjoy the rest of the day. My very best to all of you. Goodbye. <laughs>